Okay, um, welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on your time zone. Um, so, our first speaker of the day is Tianyi Zheng from University of California, San Diego. And her talk is about narrative groups and that they don't have any invariant random subgroups. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank the organizers for having me here. Um, so I first want to say I'm not an expert in locally compact groups. I mostly work on uh, finitely generated groups. So I could think about narrating groups because they're, it's, they're sufficiently close to the discrete groups I am familiar with. So, uh, so if I uh, say something wrong, please uh, correct me. And uh, also feel free to uh, stop me to ask questions or uh, make comments. Um, so let's first uh, recall some uh, recall the definition of narrating groups. Uh, so these groups were introduced in early 90s by narrating as uh, combinatorial analogs of the homomorphism group of the circle and his uh, initial interest in these groups were in uh, representation theory. Um, so let's first uh, uh, recall the definition. So take a regular tree say a fixed a finite degree q, q at least a three. So uh, mark a point O for reference. You can think of it as the root. So here is the uh, radius three ball of the tree. And then uh, as usual, you can take the tree boundary uh, as the equivalence classes of rays. And uh, you can uh, identify it as the infinite geodesics starting from O and uh, the tree boundary can be equipped with the usual topology and it is uh, homomorphic to the Cantor set. So two arrays are closed if they share a long segment. Uh, so we'll need the automorphism group of the tree and uh, it is equipped with the topology of uh, pointwise convergence. So this is a nice uh, locally compact group, totally disconnected. Uh, so maybe the quickest way to define the narrating group is to say uh, it is the uh, topological full group of the action of uh, automorphism of the tree on its boundary. So uh, you know the automorphism of the tree, they extend to the boundary and then uh, you have a nice group action on a Cantor set and then uh, you can take the topological full group of it. So, uh, so you will uh, hear a lot more about the topological full groups in Iraqi's talk. So here I just uh, recall uh, what it is, uh, what, what it looks like in this uh, very explicit setting. So here uh, we have the tree boundary and then uh, a homomorphism of the tree boundary is in the narrating group. If you can find a partition of the Cantor set into finitely many uh, this uh, disjoint clopen set. And then uh, when you restrict the homeomorphism to each clopen set, it agrees with some tree automorphism. Right? So that's the definition of a topological full group that locally uh, it looks like the tree automorphisms. Uh, globally, you are able to uh, move pieces around without uh, respecting the tree structure. Uh, so this is the definition of the group. And then here uh, we can uh, write down elements uh, very explicitly uh, because the a partition of the Cantor set, you can uh, draw it as uh, cylinders hanging on leaves of a finite subtree, right? So um, very explicitly, you can draw these uh, tree diagrams to visualize uh, homeomorphisms in the narrating group. So, uh, an element in N can be uh, represented by a triple. So here you have a finite subtree A containing the root. So here. And then, uh, so I prefer to take uh, complete finite subtrees, uh, meaning that they have the root. And then uh, any uh, vertex that is not a leaf has all of its children uh, included in the subtree. So you have, uh, so here uh, we take two complete finite subtrees with the same number of uh, leaves. And now, um, so you can make the following map. 
So delete uh, A and B from, uh, so you can delete A or B from the tree and then you get a forest. So the map can be thought of as a forest isomorphism. So uh, explicitly uh, this uh, phi map here can be written as the product of these uh, rooted tree automorphisms. So here, for instance, uh, if this is V, and then this subtree is TV. So you can first act inside the subtrees by rooted tree uh, automorphisms. And then after you do something inside each subtree, you take a bijection from the leaves of A to leaves of B, and then you move the subtrees there. So this describes uh, what is um, uh, what's, what is an element in the narrating group. So of course, this uh, tree diagram is not unique. You can always uh, grow it to the next level and have a bigger A and B. So uh, two such uh, triples are equivalent if you can enlarge them to the same picture. And then uh, elements in, in N can be thought of as uh, equivalence classes of such, uh, such uh, triples. Okay. Uh, so this is the uh, definition of the group. So any questions? Very good. Um, so these homeomorphisms uh, have various names that appeared in different places. So going back to narrating, they're called uh, spheromorphisms of the tree boundary. Uh, they're also called um, almost automorphisms of the tree. Uh, the word almost probably come from the fact that here we only take finite uh, subtrees A and B. So almost refers to that you only allow yourself a finite subtree for the freedom to uh, not to respect tree structure. And then, uh, but this word, uh, so this terminology is uh, in danger of uh, confusion with almost homomorphisms that people also study. So according to Yves Cornelier, these should be called the near automorphisms of the tree. Uh, and then uh, in this uh, work of uh, Capras and Demence, uh, they called these are uh, identified as uh, germs of automorphisms of out T. So here, this is not to be confused with a groupoid of germs of the action on the tree boundary. So it's really uh, some other kind of terminology. Uh, so I don't want to be uh, annoying here. So I'm going to just refer um, to these uh, homeomorphisms as uh, almost automorphisms. So uh, unless there is some objection or strong preference in terminology. Uh, so this is the definition. So you have this uh, nice action of the uh, automorphism group of the tree on the boundary. And then we simply take its uh, topological full group and that's the narrating group. Uh, so one important feature of it is the, is the group topology that it uh, can carry. Um, so it was uh, quite uh, fascinating to me when I first uh, saw it. So the right way to put the topology on, on N is to insist that the natural inclusion of automorphism of the tree into narrating group is open, uh, is continuous and open. So it, this gives you a well-defined uh, group topology. And uh, with respect to this topology, uh, NQ is a totally disconnected, locally compact group. So you might have other attempts to put a topology on N, but it might uh, not be locally compact. So uh, this uh, topology is uh, very important in what we, we will consider. And then, uh, so if, you, if you're familiar with the Hickman-Thompson group, uh, so this uh, picture of uh, tree diagrams uh, certainly reminds you of uh, Hickman-Thompson group V. Right? So here, uh, if I insist that uh, these sections, so these are uh, these five, these means uh, what uh, root, root permutations, uh, sorry, root automorphisms you can do inside the subtrees. If you insist that all these uh, rooted automorphisms are simply trivial, so it means that you do absolutely nothing inside these uh, subtrees. And then uh, you take a bijection and move the subtrees rigidly to, the, uh, to be rooted at the leaves of B. This gives you an element in the Higman-Thompson group V. So here the root has uh, 
Q children, and then other uh, vertices has uh, Q minus one children downward. So uh, according to the usual notation, these are written as the V Q minus one Q. Uh, so just this description, uh, just by this description, uh, you, you can see that uh, the Higman Thompson group V embeds into N in, the, in this very natural way. And if you look at the uh, topology for a moment, uh, it's clear that the embedding is dense. So this uh, dense embedding of V into N has nice consequences. So in particular, it implies that uh, N is uh, compactly generated. And so you can take a gen finite generating set for V together with one compact open subgroup, and then you can generate N. Okay. Um, so, so these are, uh, the, we will use uh, these things. And then uh, it's a result of uh, Capuchin back in 99 uh, that uh, NQ is uh, abstractly simple, meaning that it has no non-trivial normal subgroups. Uh, so this statement that uh, NQ has no non-trivial uh, invariant random subgroups is also, at least I understand it as also some kind of uh, simplicity in the sense of uh, measurable dynamics. So we'll uh, get to that later. So this, uh, this whole talk is uh, evolved around uh, simplicity in some sense. Uh, so any questions so far? I think everyone is familiar with this uh, group. Uh, so it's first, uh, so then, uh, so next let's uh, quickly recall some uh, basic things about uh, invariant random subgroups. Uh, so here, let's take a G to be a locally compact uh, second countable group. And then, uh, so with such a group, you can consider it's a Chabotty space. So here the set is uh, denoted by sub, sub G, meaning the closed subgroups of G. Uh, so we only consider closed subgroups here. And then, uh, so the topology is uh, generated by this uh, subbasis. So these two kinds of sets are open. Uh, so you want to consider sets of subgroups that avoid a given compact set and also uh, subsets of, uh, uh, and also sets of subgroups that uh, intersect a given open, open set. And then uh, you take these as a uh, sub basis for topology. So you get the Chabotty topology uh, close the subgroups of G this way. And uh, so this is a nice space uh, with respect to the, this topology sub G is uh, compact. It's also sub, uh, the topology is separable and uh, matrizable. So it's a very nice uh, place to consider probability measures. Uh, so G naturally acts on its own subgroups by conjugation. So we get a system uh, G acting on this uh, subgroups of G, close the subgroups of G. Uh, so this the notion of uh, invariant random subgroups uh, the name was coined by Albert Glasner and Virag. Um, so it's it's a little bit strange because it, it's actually a measure, but it's called a subgroup. But uh, but I think people uh, understand what it means. Uh, so an IIS of G is a G invariant probability measure on a sub G, and here uh, we the sigma algebra is the Borel sigma algebra. So uh, so it's basically you consider the G action on its own uh, closed subgroups and you take the invariant measures and these invariant measures are called uh, IISs. So, so the study of IIS is, uh, is really a study of uh, invariant measures for this particular action. And then, uh, so it's related to measurable dynamics by this uh, nice proposition. Uh, so this, uh, these uh, seven authors are known as the seven samurais. Uh, they have this uh, famous paper on uh, IISs and uh, relation to other topics. Uh, so here, um, so, they, uh, so the proposition tells you that uh, all IISs arise in the following way. They are induced by PMP actions of G. So here, uh, induced, uh, induced, uh, induced IISs mean the following thing. 
So you consider a probability measure preserving action of G. So here X is some space, V is the measure preserved by G. And then uh, given this, you can consider the following map. So for every point in X, you can consider it's a stabilizer under G action. So uh, this gives you a map from the space X into the, the into sub G. And then you can push the invariant measure uh, new to an um, invariant measure in sub G that is an IRS. And then uh, all IRSs arise this way. So um, in, in measurable dynamics, people often consider essentially free actions, especially in the study of the orbit equivalence. Typically you consider uh, free actions, but if you move to non-free actions, then IRSs appear naturally as the stabilizers. So these are, uh, this is the nice thing about, uh, so they are really uh, stabilizers of uh, PMP actions. So here are a few uh, basic examples. So you always have, uh, you can put delta mass on normal subgroups because normal subgroups are invariant under conjugation. So you can just uh, pick this point and put the delta mass on that. So in particular, there are two uh, very trivial ones. You can always put the delta mass just on the trivial subgroup and you can put the delta mass on the whole group. So these two are referred to as trivial IISs that uh, every uh, group have. And then, uh, so this is the normal subgroups. And then uh, you can also consider uh, close the subgroups of finite covolume. So if you have a gamma, that is the closed subgroup of finite covolume, you can consider its uh, conjugations under G. And then, uh, so just by definition, uh, this conjugation action factors through the cosets. And then you can push forward the finite the normalized Haar measure on this uh, cosets on, on G mod gamma to uh, an invariant measure on sub G. So this uh, tells you that um, close the subgroups of finite covolume in particular lattices can, can give you uh, particular examples of invariant random subgroups. So that's the, uh, that was one reason people were interested in studying IRSs. It, they uh, simultaneously generalize normal subgroups and uh, lattices. So that was of some interest to understand. Uh, so here is one more example uh, that this is our typical IISs that arises from uh, actions. So let's have, let's consider some group G acting on a rooted tree. So here uh, I wrote the oh, uh, subscript to emphasize its uh, action by rooted tree automorphisms. And then, uh, so you have, you go to the boundary. So G, the action extends to the tree boundary and then you have an invariant measure that is uh, just a uniform measure on the boundary. And then uh, in this, and then uh, just this uh, description that uh, PMP actions give you a stabilizer IISs. From this picture, you know that uh, the action on the tree boundary this way uh, gives you a stabilizer IISs. Uh, so this, these uh, examples arise uh, especially when you consider some examples of uh, rooted tree automorphisms like the Greek or true group or similar uh, branch groups. So these are maybe the first examples you can think about. And then, uh, so there are much more to it. So there's no good reason why you only consider a fixed stabilizer of one point. So instead you can consider a stabilizer, pointwise stabilizer of a closed subset. So if you take a closed subset of the tree boundary, you can consider it's a pointwise fixator, pointwise stabilizer, so written as a fixed GC here. And then, uh, so if you find an invariant measure on closed subsets of the tree boundary, then you can push it forward to get an IIS. Uh, so this is just, uh, just a given a closed subset, you can take its pointwise stabilizer. So this way you also obtain, you obtain more examples of IISs associated with this action on the tree boundary. Okay. 
And then, um, so these are typical examples. Then you might ask, uh, uh, what if the action is such that uh, there is uh, no non-trivial invariant measures on the closed subset that you, on the space that you uh, started with? Uh, so in many examples, uh, absence of uh, such invariant measures is an indication that the group has a few uh, invariant random subgroups. So here, uh, so we are getting closer to the narrating groups. So suppose, uh, so in this, uh, so let's consider the following situation. So you have some group G uh, defined, so it's a faithful action, say by homeomorphisms on some uh, topological space X. And then suppose uh, for some reason you, uh, you already know that the action of G on closed subsets of X has no uh, agogic invariant measures other than the trivial ones that put uh, delta mass on either empty set or the whole space. And then, uh, so this kind of thing, sometimes you can recognize pretty easily when you see the action has some, uh, there was some, something compressible or something paradoxical that uh, prevents you from having non-trivial invariant uh, measures. So one example is the Hickman-Thompson group. Uh, so here I wrote the other uh, notation dk, again it means uh, the root has k children and uh, other vertices has the d children downward. Uh, so if you consider the Hickman-Thompson group uh, VDK acting on the tree boundary, uh, then there is uh, no non-trivial invariant measures. This is an exercise you can just uh, think about it and it's quite easy to see that there is something paradoxical going on here that you cannot possibly have non-trivial invariant measures. Uh, so this means that you cannot uh, produce IRSs in the way that we described with the, with the situation here, that you are able to uh, take, take invariant measures, on, uh, close the subgroups and uh, take the uh, pointwise fixators. And then, uh, so you want to say, uh, maybe this, this, uh, this fact can be uh, promoted or upgraded to the statement that uh, there is no uh, non-trivial uh, IISs. And then uh, so for, uh, for Hickman-Thompson group and some similar uh, countable topological full groups, this is indeed uh, possible to do. Uh, so what you need uh, be besides this uh, input from some dynamic consideration that there is no invariant measure on uh, Fx, uh, so the other ingredient uh, one can get, one can uh, put into this is the uh, so-called uh, double commutator lemma. Uh, so this lemma uh, for normal subgroups is uh, well known and is uh, used in proof of uh, simplicities. So here is the statement. So if you, uh, so here I want to emphasize uh, this is only proved for uh, countable groups. Okay, so the proof uh, strongly relies on the fact that there is uh, no uh, invariant probability measure on a countable infinite set. It's repeatedly used. Uh, so the proof for this lemma, uh, I know that uh, the proof that I know only works for countable groups. Uh, so, so, so suppose we have a gamma countable uh, acting faithfully on some second countable host of space X. Here, all these assumptions are there to guarantee that uh, I only need to take uh, countable units of uh, measure zero sets. Suppose you have this setting and take an agadic IRS of the countable group, uh, which is not uh, delta mass on the uh, trivial group. Uh, so, if the, uh, so for such an IRS, uh, almost every uh, sample you can find so since it's not a trivial, it has to move something on the set. And then the statement is that uh, there exists some open uh, empty set U uh, such that the, the subgroup contains the derived subgroup of the rigid stabilizer. So, so here a uh, rigid stabilizer, uh, so the definition is that uh, so sometimes it's written as a uh, and more often it's written as a rigid stabilizer and then the group and the set. So I only wrote an R here. 
Uh, so rigid the stabilizer of gamma in U, it means that uh, a group element is in there if it's, uh, it, only act in, it only acts inside U and fixes every uh, point in the complement of U. So the, so the, so the definition is uh, you fix every single point outside U. Uh, so this terminology is uh, used uh, in, in the theory of uh, branch groups uh, by Grigorchuk. So that's the place I learned the terminology rigid stabilizer. So here um, on the tree, if you want to think about this, um, so for instance, if the, uh, the set U on the tree boundary is uh, the sort of the shadow of this, then it means that the action is only on this branch and on all the other branches, they are completely fixed. So this is what the, what the word rigid comes from. It only acts inside some place and then outside there's nothing going on. Okay. Um, so, so the same, so this is really a direct analog of uh, the same lemma for normal subgroups that you probably know very well. Um, that is says the, the version, the classical version for normal subgroup says that if you have a normal subgroup and uh, then that is not too trivial then you will be able to find open non-empty sub uh, open non-empty sets U such that the normal subgroups contains the derived subgroup of the rigid stabilizer. So, uh, so this is the generalization of the uh, property known for normal subgroups to uh, invariant random subgroups. And then, uh, if you assume a little bit more about the rigid stabilizers, so. Let's assume that uh, the rigid stabilizer, I think I wrote, I should write a gamma here. So if I assume that the rigid stabilizer has uh, no fixed point in, in U, so this in particular uh, implies that the, this uh, rigid stabilizer is non-trivial. Uh, such actions are called, uh, sometimes called uh, micro-supported. If you are able to, uh, to see that the rigid stabilizers for any non-empty non open set is non-trivial. That's uh, sometimes called uh, micro-supported. Here, I, I assume that uh, there is no fixed point inside. And then uh, for such, if this is true, then you can say a little bit better uh, that uh, for an invariant random subgroup uh, mu, almost every sample satisfies the property that uh, if a point in the in the space is not fixed by edge, then you will be able to find an open neighborhood of this point such that our uh, edge contains the derived subgroup of the rigid stabilizer in this uh, neighborhood. So this, uh, so this lemma, uh, so this version of the lemma can really be used in the same way, almost identically in the same way as uh, for normal subgroups to derive properties that um, IRS must uh, satisfy. As I uh, said, already said that uh, the version for normal subgroup is really uh, classical and well-known, and it is behind the proof of uh, simplicity in many, many examples. It probably goes back to uh, Higman. And uh, so in the work of Grigorchuk, it's used to show, give a criterion when uh, branch group is uh, just, is just uh, infinite. And then uh, more recently, uh, in the work of uh, Hiroki Matui and uh, Volodya Nekrushevich, this, uh, this kind of lemma is used to show simplicity of the derived subgroup of uh, topological full groups. So this is really some very, uh, it's uh, really the common reason behind uh, simplicity. So here uh, we want to, understand in certain classes similar for similar reason we get some kind of uh, simplicity in the measurable sense so it's not uh, surprising that uh, lemmas like this uh, can be useful uh, so I want to say uh, I want to mention that uh, for uh, UISs what's called the uniform recurrence subgroups there is a very similar version for this uh, lemma approved by uh, uh, Labudek and uh, Nicola Matabon. So they, these can be used to study uh, topological dynamics. Um, so, so using this lemma, so this version of the lemma, and the fact that uh, 
for the Hickman-Thompson group, if you consider its action on the tree boundary, uh, there is no non-trivial environment measure on the space of closed, sub, uh, closed subsets. You can deduce that uh, the derived subgroup of V has uh, no non-trivial IISs. Uh, so this fact, this, uh, this result was known uh, by uh, Dadiko and Mendelitz. It was proved by some other method. So they considered uh, what uh, they considered uh, characters of the of the uh, group V. And uh, so inside the proof, you could see something very similar going on. That they use some compressed something about uh, compressibility of certain things. And uh, so you went through a different route. But if you think about it, there is some common phenomenon going on. Um, so this is uh, what happens for uh, countable groups. So if uh, so, with these two ingredients, it's already uh, enough to deduce that uh, there is no non-trivial uh, invariant random subgroups. Uh, so now, uh, so this lemma is uh, quite useful, and uh, but it's only uh, proved for uh, countable groups. So you might ask, uh, can this uh, kind of uh, basic lemma be uh, extended to uh, non-discrete uh, TTLC groups. Uh, so I really don't know. Um, so the only uh, example that I understood was um, this lemma, this version of this lemma can be extended to certain uh, elliptic subgroups of the narrating group. And uh, so the proof went through some uh, very explicit counting in finite sub quotients. So it does not uh, generalize easily to uh, more abstract settings. So uh, it would be, I think it's a meaningful question to ask if a uh, similar uh, commutator lemma holds in non-discrete settings. Um, so, so here I want, so, uh, so want to explain a bit uh, why uh, suddenly I mentioned uh, elliptic subgroups. So this was, uh, so this, so the idea came from the proof of uh, absence of lattices in this uh, work of uh, Bader, Capras, Galander, and Moses. So this was maybe one of the striking properties of narrating groups that got people interested in uh, studying studying this. So the proof, uh, so the proof that N has no lattice really uh, goes through that, and op the the open subgroup O does not have any lattice. Uh, so it's it's quite easy to describe what is this uh, elliptic subgroup O. Uh, so remember this uh, this uh, tree diagram pictures we've seen before. So here uh, let's take some very special forms for A and B. So for so we take A and B to be the same, uh, and they're this uh, finite subtree of uh, level n. So we just uh, start from the root. And grow the tree for uh, length uh, for uh, depth n, so you get this uh, nice uh, subtree. And then uh, this uh, O n is defined to be, uh, you can think of it as the uh, group element that can be represented by the triple A B. So A and B is A B are the same as this uh, finite subtree. And then uh, you can take uh, forest isomorphisms uh, on this picture. So if you think about this for a moment, it's really a semi-direct product, right? So you can take uh, any uh, permutation of the leaves on this level, on level n. And then beneath level n, uh, you have to do a rooted tree automorphisms. So this is really just a, a semi-direct product. And then uh, so on is, uh, is this uh, subgroup. And then you take O to be the increasing union of uh, ON. Okay, so ON itself is an open subgroup and O is the union of these uh, o, ONs. And then, um, so, so the proof goes uh, like this. So you want to understand why it, uh, N cannot have any lattice. And then, uh, so suppose you take, uh, so suppose you manage to uh, find one, you want to derive a contradiction. Uh, so what you do, so the, the proof goes through that you uh, induce the lattice in O, right? so because O has the infinite tau measure, so you, the gamma has to intersect O. 
So by intersection, you get a lattice in O. So now you want to see that this is actually uh, impossible. Uh, so this notation that so wrote this O uh, as the intersection. So here, uh, the contradiction comes from uh, two things uh, that there is some tension between the topology and the power measure or say volume counting. So here, uh, because gamma is discrete, so it means that uh, here you must be able to find a level large enough such that um, gamma does not intersect these, uh, these tree automorphisms in a, in a non-trivial way. And so that's just to avoid a, a neighborhood of the identity. And then, uh, so this is what uh, discreteness uh, requires you to have. And then at the same time, it's the lattice. So you have a finite co-volume. And if you do the volume calculation for the projections to the symmetric groups, you would realize that the projections to the symmetric groups uh, cannot be small, right? Because it has this uh, fixed uh, co-volume to start with. So um, if you uh, translate it into calculations in the finite sub quotients, you will see that the projections has to be big. So now there is some conflict uh, between these two properties because uh, if you have a large subgroup of the symmetric group, it will include a lot of uh, permutations. And then a large subgroup, it's very hard to avoid the tree automorphisms. So that's the rough outline. And then the, the actual proof, well, we have to uh, consider uh, exactly what, what happens in these uh, subgroups of the symmetric group. And they invoked uh, some very uh, strong results of uh, Babai about uh, subgroups of uh, symmetric groups. And it's a pretty difficult calculation. But if you look at it from very far away, it's really there is some uh, tension between the topology and the volume counting in some sense. Uh, so we want to uh, do something similar to the invariant random subgroups. So at the end of the day, uh, it's still some tension between the topology and the volume counting. Uh, so, so the proof uh, that uh, narrating group have no uh, non-trivial IIS uh, goes, uh, the outline is the following. Um, so here I also want to uh, induce uh, IISs in elliptic subgroups. So in this proof, uh, so in the lattice case, it's enough to consider this uh, specific O. Uh, for what I want to do, it's um, you need to uh, consider a little, you need to relax the shape a little bit, but it's not difficult. So we'll define a OA to be uh, as follows. So you start with an A that is a complete uh, finite tree like this. And then uh, a n uh, just means that you grow. So you take a as the as the starting uh, sub subtree, and then you just grow it downward to four level n. So here drawn is a one. So just grow one one level. Okay. And then uh, similar to o n, we define uh, o a n as the as this uh, semi direct product that you can. Uh, it's basically all these uh, forest isomorphisms that you can draw on uh, uh, AN to AN. Okay. So these are open subgroups. And then uh, OA is just the increasing union when you grow N to infinity. Okay. So this is, is that what, uh, the, what I mean by the uh, elliptic subgroups. And then, uh, so the first thing is to uh, consider so the reason for considering these uh, OAs are they, these, these subgroups have a very nice, uh, almost like these uh, locally finite groups that you see often with the topological full group associated with Bratelli diagrams. So here, um, they, it's, uh, the structure is clear. It's an increasing union of semi-direct products. So you can easily uh, intersect with OAN and then project to the uh, same symmetric group that uh, comes with the definition. So uh, it's very convenient to uh, induce IRSs in subquotients. That is one reason we want to consider these uh, 
OAs. And then, uh, so the first step, so let's, uh, so, uh, so the outline goes like this. So let's take an agardic IIS of, uh, of N and assume that it's not a trivial. And then the first thing is we um, want to uh, verify that uh, almost surely uh, edge cannot avoid all these OAs. So the statement is like this. So for mu almost every edge, you can find some finite A that might depend on edge such that uh, edge intersect this uh, subgroup OA uh, to be non-trivial. So this is not so hard to prove. Um, you can argue by contradiction. If um, there is, uh, if you avoid all OA, it will be way too thin, and then it will violate some uh, possibility of a supporting environment. So this part is not difficult. Um, so the the purpose is to see that um, it's meaningful to consider uh, induced uh, IRSs in subgroups of OA. So if you go over all the possible A's, you will cover the support of the measure. And uh, the configuration of finite A's, it's a countable list. So we are OK uh, with uh, taking your name like this. Uh, so this is the first step that uh, we, are, we are also allowed to go to these uh, elliptic subgroups. And then the heart of the proof is this uh, uh, commutator lemma, exactly in the same form as the uh, one I stated for countable groups. So here, uh, let's consider an agardic IRS of OA that is not trivial. And the statement is that uh, for almost every sample, uh, you can find some non-empty open set of the tree boundary such that uh, edge contains the derived subgroup of the rigid stabilizer. So here, uh, in the first step, when you induce like this, you lose a godicity, but that's not a problem. You can you can uh, use do an agadic decomposition, and so that's not a, really an issue. Uh, so this so the proof of this uh, proposition is uh, is a bit uh, too uh, explicit. It relies on uh, spe specific accountings in the symmetric group. So I'll uh, say a word about how it goes uh, uh, in a moment. So why is this so uh, useful? Uh, so, so this containment uh, allows you to uh, push the problem to V. So just recall that uh, the, we have the Higman-Thompson group V sitting in N in this uh, very natural way. And um, so if you have a subgroup H, that uh, contains this kind of a derived subgroup of the rigid stabilizer, then you would imply that it also intersects the, stab, uh, the derived subgroup of V non-trivially, right? because V is there. And then, uh, so, so this, this containment implies non-trivial intersection. And then uh, you, can, you can now consider what do you induce in subgroups of V uh, of v prime, uh, of the derived subgroup of V. So here this map, uh, so it's a usual inducing. So you, you take a subgroup of N and then you intersect it with the derived subgroup of V. So here there is no measurable uh, issue because uh, V is countable. So here this operation is okay. And then, uh, so we, we take our original uh, mu that we started with and to push it to an IRS of V prime. And now uh, we know that the image cannot be uh, cannot charge a trivial group because of this uh, containment. That the the intersection cannot be uh, just identity. So this means that we actually get a non-trivial uh, IRS of derived subgroup of V. And now um, it's almost uh, finished. That we know that um, the derived subgroup of V has no non-trivial IRS. So any IRS is a convex combination of delta mass at trivial group and delta mass at the whole group. And we rule out the possibility of a charging trivial group. So it has to be the whole group. So the conclusion here is that uh, mu almost every subgroup H must contain uh, the derived subgroup of V. 
Uh, so now recall that edge is closed. So you so you you just uh, take the closure of uh, B prime, and then uh, it's the whole group. Okay. So uh, so the the outline uh, it's uh, it's a bit similar to the proof of absence of lattice. So we uh, go to these uh, elliptic subgroups of A, and then prove some properties of uh, induced IRSs there, and then. Uh, Using using this uh, containment of rigid stabilizers, uh, it implies that it has to intersect with the Higman Thompson group, and then we conclude using uh, known results about invariant random subgroups of V. So it's somewhat uh, by this uh, roundabout. It's another instance that uh, good properties of V can be pushed to uh, properties of N. Um, so this is the uh, outline of the proof. So maybe I spend a few more minutes uh, explaining uh, what goes into this uh, commutator lemma. Any questions? Um, so here, uh, so I just to show show you a picture. Uh, uh, so the basic way to uh, so the basic idea is to, so we start with uh, measure mu, that is the, the invariant random subgroup, and then we want to uh, make it easier to understand by doing, uh, say, take a covering of the space and restrict it to each piece, can intersect with subgroups, take induced IRS, and uh, disintegrate it over some uh, events, and so on, uh, in all these uh, operations you can do with a probability measure to uh, arrive at something with the low that, that are easier to understand. This is the basic uh, idea that, uh, that I do, uh, that is used repeatedly. So here, um, so the, the tension uh, between the topology and the volume counting can be visualized like this. So, so because, of, because these are uh, all A ends they are uh, open, so you can consider events like this. Uh, so it's written as some big theta U V A. So it means that you draw this uh, finite tree A, and then there are two distinct leaves U and V. So I consider the event that the subgroup H contains some some homomorphism gamma uh, that is that belongs to uh, O A zero, uh, which means that you it's the semi direct product. That, you, that does tree automorphisms beneath the leaves of A, and then you permute the leaves around. Um, so the requirement is that you send U to V, and then uh, beneath it, beneath these things, uh, there are all uh, tree permutations, the tree automorphisms. Okay, so this is uh, an event that, uh, that describes a certain particular kind of, kind of uh, subgroups. So now suppose that you, you are on this event, that you know that inside your uh, sample, there is, um, you, are, you are able to move this whole subtree U to V by uh, tree, homo, um, tree automorphisms in some sense. And now you take this picture and uh, expanded uh, N by level N. So, so this is a drawing of uh, the green part is the original A. And then we grow the trees uh, downward by uh, de depth n. And then um, if you do this and consider what is the projection of uh, the subgroup H intersect with now this uh, bigger uh, subgroup OAN, and then pro and then uh, project to the symmetric group. So so the, the, the so the key calculation is to show that. Um, the projection to the symmetric group cannot be small because uh, you have an invariant, you have induced an invariant random subgroup inside the symmetric group. And then if the intersection is too small, then the chance of uh, seeing this particular type of permutation is too small. On the other hand, uh, this type of event, if you start with one with positive probability, there is a lower bound. Um, the chance of having such things. So in some, so this is the way that you uh, have some kind of uh, volume counting inside the symmetric group. 
uh, that you compare against the probability of this kind of uh, global events that you can see up front. And then uh, the tension between the two forces you to contain uh, large subgroups of the symmetric group. So here um, it's uh, inevitable to uh, invoke some results about subgroups of uh, symmetric groups. But the, uh, the, the only one I used was this uh, fragile sex of bound that uh, any primitive subgroup of first thing n that doesn't contain the alternating subgroup must be, uh, the size must be bounded by four to the n. So any exponential bound would do. So in some sense, uh, uh, the combinatorics or the counting is a little bit easier than the proof of absence of lattice. So uh, I think my time is up, so I don't uh, go into more details. Thank you. Thank you, Tiani. It was a great talk. Um, are there any questions? Um, no questions for Tiani? Well, if there are no questions for Tiani, well, please hit your reaction buttons in the following way. <laughs> and we can stop recording. <laughs> <laughs>